Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. <clears throat> I am the Crypto Crow, and today I'm not going to be talking about crypto. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a lot of topics that I think are relevant to what's happening in crypto. Uh, but I'm going to be real honest with you and tell you I'm nervous about making this video. But I feel like there's so many things that I, that need to be said, and you know, I'm realizing that, you know, as a 45 year old married man with a family who has been more of a loner than basically my entire life, somebody who has done everything possible to just learn all things, to, uh, to explore all avenues, different industries, different business practices, business models, ideas, religions, philosophies, you name it. I've always spent my time um, searching for truth in all things. And I have a list of topics. I will be editing this video uh, because I don't know how much of a tangent I'm going to go on in some of these uh, topics. But I feel that I wanted to share my opinion. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and you'll see the little uh, graphic over to my far right basically what I uh, what I consider to be future employment. And I am seeing this grand narrative uh, on m m almost an endless number of levels related to men bad, okay? And this this narrative is so much deeper than I think people really understand because it's not just this men bad narrative that's happening. There are, it, there are so many different layers associated with this men bad concept. You know, I recently saw, you know, Andrew Tate and how he was arrested. And, and a lot of people are saying, well, this is BS. This is nonsense. This is him. He said it was going to happen. You know, he was he's very much been someone who um, promotes uh, masculinity in men, that alpha male dominance, uh, that persona of power and wealth and, you know, getting every woman you want and so forth. And I have to I have to be honest with you right from jump. I think Andrew Tate's a pig. I mean, I do. I think he's a. I think he's a, a dirt ball, and but that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't uh, agree with quite a few of his opinions, because I do. If I'm honest, but he's still a pig, and you know, I've been seeing a lot of clips of him, uh, mostly obviously from people who are trying to shame him and create all this doubt related to the narrative of him being a trafficker and uh, all of these different things that he's supposedly allegedly done. And I've seen a lot of these videos. And the thing of it is, is I've seen, I've already seen counterparts to a lot of this, um, this anti-Tate narrative, right? You know, I just saw one gentleman who I'm realizing is definitely a kind of a, a, a left-wing shill, and he's huge. He just bought a private jet recently, and he talked. He did a video about his $13 million private jet or whatever. And I used to kind of like him, and but the slowly over time, things about him have been kind of rubbing me the wrong way. And I watched a recent video he did about Andrew Tate, and I realized in this moment, he is a left-wing shill, in my opinion. Because he basically painted this narrative trying to present as neutral, but he referenced a video where Tate had beat up a girl. And he didn't fill in the context to that. He didn't once mention the three times that the girl in question had come out on TikTok and other platforms explaining how this was a, um, a more dominant uh, s and style role play that she engaged in uh, willingly with Tate. And, you know, the, the, basically the point to this is there is this extreme narrative to the one side and then an extreme narrative to the other. And I always find that, in my opinion, the truth is often found somewhere in the middle. This video may get long. Um, I'll probably chapter it out because I feel like there's a lot to be said and I'm probably only going to ever say this once and then hope I don't get censored or banned or, or something bad happening simply because I'm sharing my own personal opinion. 
um, which today seems to be a, a big question, right? So I feel like I'm taking a big risk, but I just wanted to share my thoughts on all of these things and you'll either agree or you won't. And either way, that's completely fine. But uh, so basically we're seeing this narrative play out around um, people like Tate and around basically men are bad. I've said specifically, I believe Tate's a pig and I've listened to him and I've watched his stories uh, from his own words where he's explaining the way he generated a lot of his wealth initially. And, you know, I, I, I was actually quite shocked to see that that, that that was it, right? Everybody knows that vices rule the world. Vices generate revenue. Um, things like the, the, you know, these, um, I guess you could say adult oriented paid content platforms generate a lot of money for people, especially nowadays. And since COVID uh, really kind of hit the scene and, and people weren't able to go out, people weren't able to uh, work, you know, people, there were a lot of lockdowns associated with it. There were basically people trying to find ways of making money. And they found that in some of these platforms that helped them generate revenue for themselves to pay their bills and live their life. Uh, from their own homes. And if I look at this narrative overall and I see how the pandemic was handled and the tests associated with it, I personally believe that a lot of this stuff was, let's just say the way that a lot of these things were handled to me were, were of experimental value. And I think that the overall narrative is less control and freedom for us more control into the hands of those who are guiding us and a lot of a lot of different narratives and ideals basically in support of that grand effort and we're going to go through some of them now i'm already talking seven minutes i haven't even gotten started yet so I see, you know, one point of topic is the narrative about wage gaps. I see a lot of women basically say, hey, you know, women don't make as much money as men. This is a gap that needs to be fixed. And, you know, the reality to me, correct me if I'm wrong, is that men historically built the world. At a time when men were dying on scaffolds and, you know, dying in mass numbers, building some of the most amazing buildings and 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 industries today uh the women were taking care of children right they they weren't really a part of the workforce there and there's a lot about uh like the feminist movement that i'm not privy to that i don't study or research all day so excuse any ignorance and i don't mean to be ignorant but in my opinion at a time when men were needed to build the world women loved and respected them and understood that there was a balance in all things primarily the nuclear family the family unit where the man would go out risk his life or, or spend his time working long hours trying to be that quote unquote company man as women stayed and took care of the children took care of the home and this isn't a lesser or greater than thing i know because i work from home and i see that the work that my wife does you know my wife doesn't work she still takes care of the home and takes care of our daughter and 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 is still free to you know follow her dance dream and follow all of these things that i fully support but there's this idea of a nuclear family where the the, the man and the the husband the wife the whatever you want to call them now funny how this narrative alone is becoming something towards rents or parental units, or not even that, birthing people. All of these different narratives that are creating this, this disconnect in family overall. To me, I find it disgusting. And, and you know, a lot of this stuff, in my opinion, is shrouded as being in support of a trans gender, a trans, um, a trans element in today's society, where by defining man and woman, husband and wife and family unit and, and giving birth and all, that we're somehow excluding trans people from being able to enjoy the same sentiment associated around such a thing, such as a family. At least that's what the way I feel I'm being sold on it. And I absolutely disagree. I feel like this message is basically being sold to us using 
uh, you know, transgender, trans, uh, transsexual type elements more to camouflage the actual reason for it, the actual uh, message. And I'm almost shaking even talking about this because it's all such a touchy subject. But I feel like we are all being misled, quite frankly. I don't see any reason personally why anyone who is transsexual or transitioned from man to woman or from woman to man can't enjoy a family if that is what they want the same way my wife and I can. Where is the where where is the disconnect there? Where is I mean we've seen um, man and man couples, woman and woman couples raising children for years now, and there hasn't been any problem to my knowledge. Maybe there's some side looks and things like that. I get side looks. My wife and I get side looks. I'm seven feet tall. She's five foot. Everywhere we go, people are eyeballing us, making comments, asking us questions. We're outsiders. We're okay with that. We are we are. We, are, we just accept that that's just the way that the world is. Like, do we need to go on a, uh, a, a campaign to try and, and reprogram the entire world to be more comfortable with our size difference? Because sometimes it makes us uncomfortable, but that's, that's okay. That's just the, that's, these are the cards we're dealt and we all have a cross to bear. And that's just the way I see things. And I'm not trying to be unsympathetic to anyone that feels affected because I'm not trans and I don't know all of the the troubles, the trials, the issues, the emotional damage that can be inflicted by the, the ignorance of those with larger mouths than they do hearts, okay? I, I don't know what it's like to be affected that way, but I know that when I was young and I was 17, 18 years old going to uh, the nightclub, I used to hang out at this nightclub called The Warehouse in Cincinnati. I still, some of my best memories are from this nightclub and it was a free for all. And I was friends with a guy who had a voice like mine, talk like mine, who dressed head to toe as a woman. He just liked doing it. And he was cool. He was a smart guy. He wasn't even gay. He said, I'm not even gay. I just like to dress like a woman. And I'm like, more power to you. And I was young back then. And I was exposed to so many things. Uh, you know, I had friends of literally all walks of life and none of them bothered me. I liked all of them very much the open-minded nature of so many of these people really spawned a lot of inspiration in me in a lot of ways and has kept me out of one tribe or the other or, or basically leading my life down a road of complete and utter ignorance. And it's why my wife and I both support everyone of all creeds, all races, all whatever, because it's all of those things that gives this world a uniqueness, uh, an inspiration, a spice, a variety, Otherwise, we would all just be a bunch of gray lumps that did nothing, meant nothing. And I, 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 I take it upon myself to some, in some way to share this because I am tired of these people. In my opinion, I look at what's happening as the trans community, the LGBTQ plus community, all of these people almost being used as pawns to some degree for a narrative that doesn't benefit them. And I and I and that is my opinion. Maybe it does. And if you are among that community and that and you feel differently, let me know in the comments. Educate me. I want to know. I want to learn. How do you feel about so much of what's going on today? Do you feel protected, guarded? Uh, do you feel enlightened, inspired? Are, are, is this whole thing, is this all helping you somehow? Or do you even understand, do you see that ultimately, do you feel as though you might be being used, your cause is being used for a narrative that's completely unrelated to you? That is what I would personally like to know. And as I, I, I see things like lower testosterone in today's man, Right. I mean, you know, I've been on TRT myself for a decade and, and, and there are so many men nowadays. And the, and the question is, is 
is low testosterone in men by design? Is it some grand conspiracy where stuff's in the air or stuff's in our fueled food that's lowering this because it makes us a little more docile as an alpha uh, entity in society that, it, that is less likely to take up and fight against different forms of oppression? Like, is this a big conspiracy or is this reality? Or is it all just basically a you know, eat these Pop-Tarts or whatever all the time, or eat this food all the time, and you'll have these side effects, but we can take care of it with more pharmaceuticals that's gonna cost you more and more money each month. You know, what is that grand design or grand narrative? It could go either way, but the way I see it is so much of this is fitting in together because we have barely even dented this. We're entering a new digital age. This new digital age doesn't require a strong, hand, hairy, manly alpha man to build much. This is something of a keystroke that anybody can do. Men, women of all creeds, non-binary, whoever, whoever, whatever you classify or identify as, you can be an absolute wage-earning winner in this new digital age. I think that's fantastic. I think that's great. This is potentially the, the levity, the leverage of opportunity, the opportunity that all who put in the time to generate the skills necessary to create and build this new world, now this is your opportunity. But at the same time, because you don't got need of men like me to build it, we've become the enemy now. And that's the narrative. Not only has men, have men become the enemy, the nuclear family has become the enemy. Anything that can pose a potential threat to a grand narrative associated with individuality, okay, we have all of these pronouns, all of these ways to create the most infinite level of individuality as we're basically preparing ourselves mentally and emotionally to end up in one of those in my image. A box whether it's a figurative box, a real box, a physical box, whatever. We are slowly but surely, we're, we're being sold this idea of a grand open world where all are included and all is, all is fair, but ultimately we're actually being pigeonholed more and more and more, and that scares me. I think of all of these videos that I've seen of so many of these big speakers and wealthy billionaires talking about population reduction. We need popular, population reduction for, for climate change. I, I, I see things recently coming, up, uh, coming out about our pets. Our pets are now a topic of climate change. We shouldn't have them. And we should do all sorts of crazy things to rid ourselves and the world of our pets. Why? Why are our pets now an enemy of this? Because we're cutting connection. We're cutting ties to people and creatures and things we care about. And we're doing that in a way that is a constant state of division creation, in my opinion. And I see this population reduction and I think to myself, I remember the Georgia Guidestones and how I used to study and research about those. And I, and I, think, um, I think about this grand effort to reduce the population uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> Why exactly? Why is there not enough space? Why is a, a, our population, because if you look at the numbers, the numbers show that our population is ultimately being reduced. So why is this such a drastic call now? And why, why do they feel like this is almost like an emergency? Is it because the less people we have in the world, the more easily, easily we are all ultimately controlled and brought together as one cohesive unit that can be controlled by a much smaller body for whatever reason? Or is it really because, I don't know, the, the needs and necessities, wants and desires that we've ultimately been programmed to have this materialistic view uh, of the world where we need Gucci bags and, and fancy clothes and fancy cars and big fancy homes and things like that to feel like we are important or play a role worth living for in our own society. Is that really where we're at? 
And because of the need for all of this now, we're creating all of these negative effects on global climate and climate change in the world over. Why does this narrative seem to continue to change, but every time it changes, it's always to the benefit of some other billionaires that are selling it all to us? So the population reduction idea is a scary thing for me because I wonder my, to myself, well, how will they do that? How will they, how will they do that? I can't even speculate on any of that right now, if I, or I guarantee to lose this video at, 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 at the least. But keep that in your head. Because I think I've made enough points on that already. You can do the math and you can connect the dots. Transhumanism. Transhumanism, whether you like it or not, is definitely a topic to discuss. Why? Because if population reduction is to become a real thing, if it's not already, and the population is reduced, well, why is that such a big deal? Well, that's a big deal because if through transhumanism, we're able to enhance the mental and even potentially physical capabilities of those left we can achieve 10 times with a smaller number of people who are more easily controlled than we can with the numbers we have today at the capacities we have today. Does that make sense? Are things starting to click with you? These neural implants from Elon Musk, to be honest, I love Elon Musk, but I'm still questioning him. Why? Not because of some left-wing narrative spun out by a, 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 some media platform, but because I'm skeptical of somebody who has so many major corporations in play that are ultimately a part of a grand scheme and a grand narrative um, that I'm seeing time and time again. I'm not sure how I feel about this one individual. He talks about, you know, maybe I should buy Google next and maybe I should buy YouTube next because if I do that, I can then take care of all of the censorship and, and basically do the same thing with them uh, that I've done with Twitter. And then maybe I could do it to Facebook and so forth. And then what do you do when you've got one man who ultimately privately owns all of these platforms and we start looking at him as some form of savior that we can trust? I've seen from him time and time again where he discusses this whole idea that everything he's doing now by relate, releasing all of this, this documentation from Twitter is about establishing establishing the trust of its users. Okay, but how far does that go before that trust is then abused by that one man with now uh, an insane amount of power? That worries me. Because I don't believe anybody, any small group, you know, what is it, four or five people that own all the media outlets in the world? Um, that doesn't worry you? That basically the ideas, the ideals, the political agendas and so forth of just a small handful of people are being distributed amongst all of these platforms? Have you not seen all of the videos out all over the place where they can take 30 different news networks and they're all regurgitating the exact same lines from different cities and different states and different parts of the world? You don't think that's odd? These platforms are all voice boxes for a, a larger role in life. Let's go back to this topic, divorce and child laws. These, the laws of today are so archaic and outdated that they favor women 95, if not more percent of the time. Why is that? It's all about nuclear family, in my opinion. And it's keeping men, if you see this whole men are bad narrative, you couple that with all of these other narratives that we're seeing spun out time and time again. Every day there's a new story, a new thing, a new a group or somebody else that's basically coming for men. And the laws that are structured the way they are because they're still so archaic, I mean, divorce and child laws, custody laws in that nature, were, were, were designed at a time when they made sense. At a time when the man went out and worked, the woman stayed home with the children, ultimately didn't have opportunities to just go out and get a job and, and make a, a sufficient living on her own. You know, the, at the, the, during those times, these laws made sense. The man, you know, goes out and, and there, there were there really weren't things like abortion. There weren't there weren't all of these decisions that a woman is able to make today to ultimately decide the fate of not only a child, but the man that helped her create one. And I do say that specifically, the man that helped her create one, because ultimately 
it does take two to tango, but how many men are trapped by pinholes in a condom or I'm, I, I'm on birth control, have been for a really long time, you have nothing to worry about. She gets pregnant, oh, wow, it's not infallible, mistakes happen. Or maybe she just didn't wanna take her pill for a few days or whatever, because this gentleman makes a, a lot of money, he does very well, she looks at it as a meal ticket and it's worth having a child with this gentleman because his genes are good, he's good looking, he does well, he's intelligent, I'll have a, a child with that guy, I don't really need a man, I just want the check. And we see this time and time again. Is that sort of mentality really the kind of mentality we want raising a daughter or a child at all? She is able to control the narrative, control the environment, control absolutely everything. And in today's society, what are we seeing? We're seeing so many more toxic, narcissistic, selfish, unaccountable women. And we are basically saying, yes, these are better parents than the hardworking, honest, man with integrity who's basically breaking his back sometimes to pure poverty by providing enough ramen noodles for himself to provide for his ex or whoever she may be and the child that she chose to have that he was not able to play any real role in. And it doesn't matter what those circumstances are. You know, a lot of women, they say, oh, well, if, I'm, if I were to suffer a violent occurrence where I am impregnated, I, I deserve to have the right to get rid of that pregnancy. Well, what about the men who are ultimately forced into a, a decision or forced into a situation against their will because they were either lied to, manipulated, and I know your argument, oh, well, there are things that he can do too. Yeah, that's fine. There are things that women can do to prevent some of the other things that happen to them. But if they were to, if we were to say those things, then we're being insensitive. And it's this double standard back and forth bullshit that ultimately drives people like me insane because it's unfair, it's unrealistic, it's insensitive either way you cut it, but sometimes the insensitivity and the nature of such arguments, it's still worth it in the sense that if it's real and it's something worth considering or thinking about, maybe we should. You know, we see all of this stuff about equal rights, equal rights. Is it really about equal rights or is it about dominance? Because to me, what I see, it's, it's, this is an effort on a grand scale to establish dominance over a group of people who are suffering. Men are suffering in mass. Suicide numbers are skyrocketing. The messages we see time and time again are these loser women projecting these terrible ideas training young women to be like them because they are popular on Instagram, they are popular on TikTok. We are losing our children and our morality in our children because of these leaders who don't wanna lead, they just wanna excel in whatever way they think is, is valuable, whether that's financially, materialistically, popularity, things that ultimately only matter so much, especially if you lack a accountability, ethical grounds, integrity, morals, all of these things that ultimately create a secure environment for children, relationships of meaning and value, so forth and so on. And what happens is, is that in my opinion, while we are continuing to push forward in these grand agendas to devalue men, we are hurting our children, we're hurting ourselves and we're cutting off our noses to spite our faces. And it's gotta change. It's gotta stop. My voice isn't gonna be one for that, but my hope is that if I'm able to make people really open up and, and think about some of these things, even for a day, then so be it. We're, remo we're removing religion from all things. Everywhere you look, we're removing religion, the idea of religion. Now, I'm not a religious person. I was very religious when I was young, and then I grew up. 
But at the same time, I don't have any problem with religion, even though in my opinion, and I have a lot of my own crazy conspiracies about that I've talked to my wife about regarding religion and, and what's good, what's bad, what's, what's righteous, what's evil. We might have it all backwards. I don't know. I have my own questions. But I also know that religion is a guiding light for many people who find themselves lost in a world that's giving them no answers. And I approve of that. Some people need to, need to be guided and led to find what they need in life, to feel secure, to feel like their life has meaning or purpose. Why would we remove that? Why would we remove that? Because, because it infringes on the ideals of others who can simply choose not to play a role in it? Because the ideas or maybe the beliefs of one group of people uh, what having those beliefs uh, can be destructive to others? Yeah, to some degree, that is true. I mean, how many people have been ultimately, you know, let's just say cast away because of their sexual orientation in other countries, even in this country for that matter? Religion can be bad, but so can sugar. It's not necessarily the, the belief system or the ideology associated with some of, the, some of these things. It's some of the people that take things too far that makes a, a negative, creates a negative environment based off of these things. People that use these topics as a vehicle for their own personal agenda of destruction, of dominance, of control, with no accountability is a major problem. Religion is obviously one of those. How many times do we see pastors, priests, people of all faiths, all religions, all creeds, whatever, professing their love for God and this and that, and then they turn around and they commit a murder or they commit a, an adultery or, or, or something else. And we're constantly told, well, it's okay if you commit a sin, if you do something bad, that's okay. You're forgiven as long as you want to be forgiven, as long as you ask forgiveness, as long as you are truly sorry for what you've done, never to do it again. I remember back in the day, the Catholic Church used to sell these little cards that were almost like a get out of jail free card. I don't remember what they were, 25 cents or something like that. I, I, they have a specific name to them. But it was a, a, basically, if you pay for a card, you commit a sin, you tear up the card, your sin is forgiven for 25 cents. Look it up if you don't believe me, it's real. And I think to myself, does all things, do all things evolve around money, power, control? But at the same time, when I think of us removing religion, from all things, what we are ultimately doing is we are getting rid of a guiding light for many that, that try to live a righteous, moral life by a code or a guideline or a system of guidelines that ultimately give them purpose, that, that, that let them take the woes of the world, the stresses of the world, all of the crosses that we bear and give them up to something so that they can once again breathe easier. Why do we need to remove that for millions of people? In favor of what? That's the question. For science? How much can we trust science today? How has that narrative changed? I used to wanna be a scientist. I used to be an absolute fanatic for science. But now, what is science? It's definitely not a squirrely looking man with glasses. That is not, a, that's not science. Political division. I have never felt a larger division in our country on a national or even global scale than I do now. And it doesn't get any better. The political division in this country to me is nauseating. It is disgusting. The right versus left narrative, it's a political play, people. It's a political play. And it doesn't matter what side you're on. I watch both sides. I watch both sides and I know that the majority of quote unquote liberal news media do not report on anything potentially self-damning. I get that. Why would they? 
because it's, there is no unbiased news today. It's all focused on one side or the other. Even more independent news is very much focused on one side or the other. Because in order to get the views nowadays, as we have all been so indoctrinated into a right or left ideology, a right or left tribal uh, commitment, I guess you can say, we're all, you, you, you almost have to play into one or the other. You're not going to get the views. You're not going to build an audience anymore. Because nowadays, it's all about who's winning, who's losing, not what's going on in the world. How can I make a change? All of this division is being created to ultimately limit the power of any one of us. That is my point in this entire video. We all have our own personal narratives. We all have our personal agendas, our personal goals, our problems, our trials, our crosses to bear, our issues to overcome. Each and every one of us, we all have stresses and problems and things we think are unfair and things that we wake up to every day unsure about, Sometimes we just want to call it quits. Sometimes we feel like it's so much, it's too much. We can't help it. We can't take it. The fight is constant. It's a constant struggle just to live, breathe, survive. We feel that everything that we're looking at, everything we touch, do, and smell, taste, is trying to kill us. What is the point? What is the point? It's because of this whole feeling that makes it so much easier to enter a new tribe, to join a group of people that feel a way that we're feeling about the issues that are personally affecting us on an emotional level. We adopt these ideologies and we attack, attack the other side because that other side becomes the enemy and the ultimate reason or the cause for our own personal state of distraught or emotional dis-ease. But is it really the other side? I, I know that while one side of the news media will completely choose not to engage in particular stories that may be self-damning, I also see the narrative of, of the other side and while a lot of points may be made and, and they can be valid and they can be pointing out a lot of the flaws in the other, I am still very well aware when I watch some of this stuff that they are leaving so much out. And they cast this idea of, oh, these people just don't know what's happening. And I hate that. It makes me feel like you think I'm ignorant. That you think I don't see it. That I don't know what's happening. And I see how both sides are pit against each other back and forth like playing ping pong. And here's the other thing. While I see so many people celebrating victories about, you know, I see these Twitter files come out and I see how how controlled everything is from the inside and how, uh, you know, there's this grand effort for censoring people and censoring ideas and all of that straight out of 1984. And I think about that sort of thing and I'm like, okay, well, we already knew that a lot of that was happening, but we see so many people on the left basically cheering that on because why should the right have a voice? Why should these people who oppose us and our ideas and our feelings have a voice? But what they do not realize is that in politics, since the dawn of politics, since the Republican Party was created to fight the Democratic Party and trying to fight slavery during the times of Abraham Lincoln, there has been this constant war. But what has happened time and time again since then? It always swings back and forth. And the powers and the controls that the left may be able to effect, effectively grasp or, or, or establish or take today will very much be used against you tomorrow. These victories of today for one side mean destruction to the same people the next day time around and this is what people don't get they're cheering this stuff on based off of all of these emotional triggers not realizing that they're ultimately creating their own cell block 
This is not about high road. This is not about win or lose. Anytime we take immoral, dishonest actions to fight a foe, especially in the political system, we are creating a precedent for future destruction of the other side when it comes, and it always does. My point to all of this, I can't believe I've been talking for 40 minutes already, and you can see my head is changing color because ultimately in some ways I'm venting, and I'm trying to basically put out there this, this, um, this thought um, and and it and it truly comes from the heart. And I and I I want so badly for people on the right and the left to start talking, to start trying to understand one another. I do. I do try to understand the arguments of this side or the or that side. I am more of a conservative. My wife is very much liberal. Her sister, beyond liberal. I mean, we've got all three uh, kind of, you know, right, left, middle kind of thing going. And, you know, we have to find a place that we can all start meeting in the middle, sharing ideas, and find common ground because the thing of it is, if you look at all of us on, on a large number, number, the vast majority of us agree on so much more than we disagree on. And the topics that we may disagree on are used against us to control our situation, to control who we communicate with, to control who we talk to, understand, sympathize with, so forth and so on. This is the control. They take these trigger points, they throw them all over the news with this spun narrative associated with them to get us upset and mad at one another so that we're creating an enemy and people we've never even met or spoken to. How does any of that make sense? I don't care if you're the most insane liberal on the planet, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you with patience, with, with understanding. Um, and you know what, it's not always easy to listen to the other side and, and think to yourself, I have to sympathize with this person. I have to love my enemy. I have to know my enemy because I think that once we've started adopting that ideology over all else, we'll find that we are able to establish a common ground that will allow us to live a life of prosperity and service, love and peace without having to sell our souls to get there. I pray for all of us to anything and anyone that's out there listening, whether it's just me exerting an energy that helps change the world or there's somebody in the sky listening, something needs to be done. And I felt like a lot of this needed to be said, whether it's rambling and unclear, it's not scripted, it's not really edited. I don't even think I'm gonna edit this. I'm just gonna throw it up there as it is. It is what it is, folks, but we have to start talking and we have to start making more positive change because this, these narratives that are dividing us all are going to be the doom of all of us. Throw your coins and I'll see you again soon.